Now that we have the basics of crystallographic symmetry down, we have the vocabulary that we can start talking about the structures of extended solids. That's exactly what I'm going to do over the next few lectures. In this lecture, we're going to concentrate on the structures of metallic solids. But before we do that, let's have just a little overview of the structures of extended solids. And here, when I say extended solids, what I mean are non-molecular solids. So those kinds of substances we can very loosely divide up into, say, three categories, each with its own specific structural characteristics. We have metallic solids, where the bonds that hold the atoms together are largely delocalized electrons. And therefore, these substances prefer structures where the atoms are packed together closely. Then we'll talk about the opposite extreme, ionic solids, where the chemical bonds that hold the atoms together are actually the electrostatic attractions between cations and anions. So in those kinds of structures, what we want is we want to have as many anions around each cation as we can, and vice versa, while at the same time we would like to minimize the contacts between ions of the same charge. So we want to minimize the cation-cation and anion-anion interactions. That tends to lead to structures which have rather high symmetry and oftentimes large coordination numbers, although not as large as we see in the metallic solids. Then we can also talk about solids like diamond, silicon dioxide, tungsten trioxide, where we have strong localized covalent bonds holding the atoms together. Typically there we'll see smaller coordination numbers, sometimes we'll see high symmetry structures, and sometimes we will see lower symmetry structures. And a lot of that has to do with the coordination preferences of the elements in the substance, as well as constraints that come from the stoichiometry, as we will see. Okay, so now let's take a closer view of metallic solids. If I were talking about a two-dimensional array of spheres, and I said, let's arrange these spheres in the densest possible arrangement, you would come up with this kind of a layer, which basically is a hexagonal close-packed layer. I would have a hexagonal unit cell that would probably look something like this, with an atom on the corner of each lattice point. Um, you can see that each atom has six neighbors that are touching it. This is the densest way to pack spheres in two dimensions. Now, what happens when we go to three dimensions? What is the most efficient kind of packing? Well, I've marked the positions in this first layer, an A to indicate the top of each sphere, and then B and C represent depressions uh, in between three spheres in that layer. So if you think about it for a minute, the layer of spheres that go on top of this one is going to have the same pattern, and it's going to fit into the depressions. But the depressions marked B and the depressions marked C are too close to each other that we can fill up both. So we can only fill one or the other. Let's say that, that we put the second layer of spheres over the depressions marked with the letter B. Okay, so we could say we have an A, B stacking. All right, so if you only had two layers, this is the only possible way to stack them as densely as possible. But now, as we go to a third layer, we have two options for where the third layer can go. It could go back over the spheres marked with an A, or it could choose to go onto the depressions of the spheres marked with a C. If we put the third layer immediately over the first layer, that has a kind of symmetry where every second layer we repeat. So the repeat pattern is layer A, layer B, layer A, layer B, layer A, layer B, A, B, A, B, A, B. And we call this hexagonal close packing. If, on the other hand, we put the next layer over the depressions marked C, that would lead to a stacking that is a, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, repeating. We call that cubic close packing. If we go back to the first layer and think about the symmetry of it for a minute, 
you can see that where there's the depressions marked with a C or a B, in both of those places we have a threefold rotation axis. You could also see that over each sphere, let's say where it's marked with an A, at that spot there's a sixfold rotation axis. So this layer has hexagonal symmetry, and it makes sense if we stack a bunch of these layers uh, on top of each other, we should get a hexagonal structure, and that's what happens for the hexagonal close packing. It's somewhat less obvious how we would get a cubic unit cell out of this packing of hexagonal layers. To answer that question, let's look at the unit cells of these two structures. So here's the structure of a hexagonal close-packed metal, sometimes called an HCP metal. And so you can see that we have two atoms in the unit cell, one atom for layer A and one atom for layer B. It's probably not too hard to look at this and see how you might get a 6 sub 3 screw axis. If you rotate the gray layer by 60 degrees, and then you translate up by half the unit cell, that will make the gray layer become the green layer. All of the atoms in the structure, by the way, are crystallographically equivalent. They all reside on one Wyckoff site. Now, how do we get the cubic unit cell from these hexagonal layers? And the key thing to remember is that in a cube, there is a threefold rotation axis along the body diagonal. So then it makes sense that if we were to look at the direction normal to the layer stacking, A, B, C, A, B, C, that's the vertical direction in this drawing, that would be the threefold axis of our cubic unit cell. And so you can see um, some parts of the unit cell drawn in here. If we were to shave this away so we only have the atoms that are left at, that are at least partially in the unit cell, we would get this structure where you can see as we move along the body diagonal, we go from layer A to B to C and then back to A. If you look at this again for a minute, you'll notice that this unit cell has an atom on each corner and one at each face. So this is a face-centered cubic unit cell. And it's the simplest kind of face-centered cubic unit cell you could have. Uh, FM, three bar M is the space group, and all of the atoms are crystallographically equivalent. They all sit on Wyckoff site 4A. Now you probably also know that not all metals have this close-packed arrangement. We also encounter body center cubic metals like alpha iron. The structure of polonium is a rare example of a primitive cubic metal where we have a cubic unit cell and only atoms on the corners. I kind of skipped over it, but in cubic and hexagonal close pack structure, each metal atom has 12 nearest neighbors. Six in the plane in which it resides, three in the plane above, and three in the plane below. And the packing density of that structure is 74%. That is to say, 74% of the available volume is taken up by spheres, and the other 26% is voids. In a body-centered cubic metal, you can see pretty easily that the coordination number goes down to eight. Each atom has a cube of nearest neighbor atoms around it. And in the primitive cubic metal, the number of nearest neighbors goes down to six. Okay, and consequently, the packing efficiency and the density goes down as we go to body-centered cubic and primitive cubic metals. How much it goes down, I'm going to leave that for an exercise that you can do in the homework. It's also interesting to note that all three structures, cubic, close-packed metal, a body-centered cubic metal, and a primitive cubic metal, have exactly the same site symmetry for the atom. And that's because that 12-neighbor structure in the close-packed structure, the cube in the body-centered structure, and the octahedron in the primitive cubic structure, they all have M, 3-bar M, or OH symmetry. Now, you might think that metals would show a strong preference for these close-pack structures. The cubic close-pack structure, here called face-centered cubic, and the hexagonal close-pack structure are both equally dense ways of packing the spheres. But we can see from this snapshot of the periodic table showing us the structures of different elemental metals that the close-pack structures aren't that much more prevalent than the body-centered cubic structure. 
which is uh, less dense packing. You can also see that there is some kind of periodic variation in the most stable structure. The reason behind that is something I've thought about quite a bit. I've read papers on it. It's not that easy to distill down into a few words, though. It basically has to do with the nature of the bonding and the filling of the bands that make up the band structure of these metals. Now let's talk about a few structures of metals that don't quite correspond to one of those four structures we've talked about already. Just as the cubic and the hexagonal close packing have equal packing efficiencies, we could have structures which have other stacking arrangements that are not AB, 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 or ABC, ABC, ABC. You could have something like shown here for lanthanum, where you have A, B, A, C, A, B, A, C. Right? That's also a close packed arrangement, but it's a different pattern than the two simple arrangements we've talked about so far. Uh, and so we see that kind of structure for things like the rare earth metals and, and some other metals. There's a notation, in fact, two notations for describing this. One of them, the Ramsdale notation, we won't worry about too much. That would be 4H. And the meaning of that is we have four layers in the unit cell, A, B, A, C, before we start to repeat. And the space group is a hexagonal one. Here we see the space group is P63 over MMC hexagonal. There's also something called the jagodinsky wyckoff notation. And in that one, we put the type of layers. So the jagodinsky wyckoff notation here is HC squared. So that means in one unit cell, we have a hexagonal layer, cubic layer, hexagonal layer, cubic layer. Now, it may not be that obvious to you why we're calling some layers hexagonal and others cubic. And the way we can distinguish those two is here you can see that this layer, the second layer in the unit cell, is denoted as a hexagonal layer. Why is that? That's because the sequence is A, B, A. So the layer above and the layer below are both an A layer. And that's exactly what you would get in a hexagonal stacking. A, B, A, B, A, B. Every B layer would have an A above and below it. On the other hand, the middle layer here we're calling a cubic layer, and the reason for that is because the layer above and below are different. It, this goes B, A, C. So the A is sandwiched by a B layer and a C layer, and because they're different, we call that a cubic packing layer. And then we come back to the third layer here, which is a C layer, but above and below that, we have A and A. So because the sandwich has the same kind of layer on either side, we call that a hexagonal layer. So that's where we get this jagodinsky wyckoff notation. We can also get the structures of some metals if we were to take these simple structures we've talked about, face-centered cubic, body-centered cubic metals, even a hexagonal close pack metal, and then we were to order different metals onto those same sites. So for example, if we take the body center cubic metal and we make the atom at the body center different from the atoms at the unit cell corners, then we get the cesium chloride structure. Now you might be saying, hey, wait a minute, cesium chloride structure, that's the structure of an ionic compound. And that's true, cesium chloride is an ionic compound. But all of these examples here also take the cesium chloride structure. So palladium indium, that's certainly a metallic structure. Magnesium gold, that's another metallic structure. All right? And when we do that, because we break the equivalence of the symmetry of the atom at the body center and the one at the corner, they're different now. This is no longer a body center cubic structure. In fact, the space group now becomes primitive cubic. We can do the same thing with a face center cubic metal. So if we take a, a face center cubic metal like gold or copper, they're both face center cubic metals, but they form an ordered intermetallic structure when you mix them in a three to one ratio. It's called the copper three gold structure. 
And so here you see that the gold atoms sit at the corners of the unit cell and the copper atoms sit on the faces of the unit cell. And here's a few other examples of compounds that have this ordered intermetallic copper three gold structure, right? So to have one of these ordered intermetallic structures, we have a fixed composition, right? This is not an alloy. It is an ordered intermetallic compound. And then maybe I'll mention one last structure that we find among metals that's important primarily because this samarium cobalt-5 is actually a very important magnet. And in the samarium cobalt-5 structure, we get one of the largest coordination numbers I can think of. So here we have a hexagonal unit cell with samarium atoms at the origin, and then we have five cobalt atoms within the unit cell. And so if we were to extend this out and put a few unit cells together, you can see that each Samarium is surrounded by 18 cobalts. So we have a hexagonal prism. That's right, there's a hexagon right above it and another hexagon right below it. And then if we were to cap each face of that hexagon with another cobalt, we would get this six capped hexagonal prism and gives a coordination number of 18 cobalts around the samarium.